thank you very much for, for coming. Very uh, exciting to be back at in-person talks again. It's been it's my first first in-person talk I've been to in two plus years, I think. Um, and we're very, very happy to have Maria Stentos visiting this week. Um, Maria and I have been working together for yeah, almost two years now. We met early on in the pandemic and uh, this week we met in person, first time in 3D. So very happy to have her visiting here this week. We've got um, yeah, three or four irons in the fire, a bunch of joint projects we've been working on. And uh, this is the first one that we've been able to uh, publish so far. Um, so this is the talk that Maria will be giving a crypto in a few weeks time, but we get, uh, we're lucky to have the, the longer version today. So thanks. Okay. Hi everyone. Thanks for the intro and the invitation to talk. Um, as Craig said, I'll be talking about joint work with Craig and Jane, who was an intern here at Microsoft uh, last summer, I think. And it's on um, accelerating the Dell Scalbraith algorithm with fast subfield root detection. Okay, so here's a brief outline. First, I'll kind of give the intro of isogeny crypto and the, the problem we're trying to attack. Then I'll talk about the Dell Scalbraith algorithm, which is the best attack against this problem. And then I'll talk about our improved um, attack. Okay, so some motivation why we are interested in this problem. So the super singular isogeny problem is the foundational problem in isogeny based cryptography. Uh, the security of B side and ski sign, which are two, um, so B side is a key exchange and ski sign is a signature scheme based on isogenies um, relies on its difficulty and the best known attack against this problem is the Dell Scalbraith algorithm. So first I'll sort of give a very brief intro to elliptic curves and isogenies and then I'll explain sort of what the problem is and what the attack is. So yeah, our contributions will be an optimized implementation of this um, algorithm, which we called Solver. And then um, we developed an uh, efficient method to detect whether a polynomial over some uh, like finite field FP to the D has a root in the subfield FP. And then we use this technique to introduce an improved attack, which has lower concrete complexity. So the disclaimer of this improved attack is that it doesn't affect the asymptotic complexity, it only decreases the concrete complexity. Okay, so very briefly, an elliptic curve over FP squared um, when P is not two or three is just a smooth curve given by this equation. And uh, your coefficients A and B lie in the finite field and this condition just ensures that your curve is non-singular. And then we will be considering super singular elliptic curves. Um, and this is mostly for an efficiency reason and SIDH uses super singular elliptic curves. And um, we'll only really be interested in our elliptic curves up to isomorphism. And so you can label each of these like classes, isomorphic classes by the J invariance, which is just given by this funky formula and two elliptic curves will have the same J invariant if and only if they're isomorphic over FP squared. And so we can use these as our labels for our isomorphism classes. So then an isogeny is a map between two elliptic curves um, that is non-constant and that takes your identity on your first elliptic curve to the identity on the second elliptic curve. And isogenies have a couple of really nice properties. Firstly, for separable isogenies, and all the isogenies we consider are separable, so don't have to worry about what that means. The a degree of our isogeny is just given by the size of the kernel. Um, it's a group homomorphism, which means that if you add two points um, and map them by phi, it's the same as mapping P by phi and Q by phi and then adding them in the image. 
Um, we can also factor isogenies. So if you're given an isogeny between two elliptic curves, you can find another two isogenies that will compose to give your original isogeny. And then the degrees uh, will sort of multiply to give the correct degree of your original isogeny. And as an example, if you have an isogeny of degree two to the n, you can factor these into uh, n isogenies of degree two. Okay. So the super singular isogeny problem in its most general form asks us to find an isogeny between two super singular elliptic curves defined over fp squared. Um, and here, it really is a very general problem because we're not assuming knowledge of any torsion point information and we're not assuming that we know the degree of this isogeny, which is the case in SIDH. So in SIDH key exchange or psych, you uh, reveal some torsion point information to make everything commute. Um, and so the problem is sort of maybe a bit easier because you have some extra information. But this general problem, we don't assume that we know any of, any of that torsion point information. Um, and this problem is conjectured to be hard for both classical and quantum computers, which is what makes isogeny-based cryptography post-quantum secure. Okay, so the next kind of big object in isogeny crypto is this isogeny graph. And letting P be a large prime um, that does not divide L. This graph consists of vertices, um, which are labeled by, uh, sorry, which represent classes of super singular elliptic curves. And these can be represented by the J invariant, as I mentioned before. And this J invariant lies in FP squared, and so all your vertices are labeled by this J, which lies in FP squared. Um, and then your edges in your L isogeny graph it will be L isogenies. So two elliptic curves will have an edge um, if they have an L isogeny that connects them. And an L isogeny is just an isogeny of degree L. Um, yeah. So this has some nice properties. First, there are a finite number of vertices, so P over 12. And that's just the number of classes of super singular elliptic curves. It's L plus one regular, meaning that from every uh, vertex, you have L plus one edges coming from it. No, sorry, going out of it. Um, it has what's called the expander property, which means that if you take a sort of relatively short path in the graph and you uh, end on an end vertex, it's almost as good as sort of just uniformly picking one of the vertices. Um, so intuitively, it means that the graph sort of mixes very well and you can get to a random vertex in a short path. Um, yeah, and so pathfinding is conjecture to be hard for classical and quantum computers. So kind of the link between this and the isogeny problem is that um, finding a path between two elliptic curves in this graph will be finding an isogeny between two elliptic curves. Um, and so pathfinding is sort of equivalent to um, the isogeny problem that we're trying to solve. Okay, so a key observation for the del Galbraith algorithm um, is that there's sort of a subgraph lying within your big graph. So here are all the, like some finite number of vertices and these are all labeled by J invariants, um, which lie in FP squared. The white uh, color represents J invariants that lie in FP squared and do not lie in FP, so like the subfield. And then you have this subgraph of blue nodes that um, are the J invariants that lie in your subfield FP. 
And there are um, order of square root of p nodes of these blue ones and around order of p of these white ones. And sort of the key idea of Dels Galbraith is that taking a walk in this subgraph is comparatively easier. And so you want to take, uh, and so if you could somehow land in the subgraph, then it would be easier to find a path. So, yeah, so this is just what I was saying. The path between the blue nodes is easy to find, and you want to find a way to find a path to the blue nodes and then sort of connect two blue nodes together. Um, so what they do is they have a star and an end node, and these are just your, the two elliptic curves that you want to find a path between. The first step is to find paths um, between your star node and some blue node in your graph. So with J invariant lying in FP. And same for your end node. You want to find an isogeny or a path in your graph that takes your end node to some blue node in your graph. And this is the bottleneck step. Um, and it will take you around order square root of P um, operations. And then once you have your two blue nodes, you can find a path between them. And this is comparatively easier because you can do it in order the fourth root of P. Um, and then because you can factor isogenies, you can sort of compose them together to get a path, um, like compose this path with that path and then sort of the reverse of the other path to get your desired path between the two, two nodes. And this will correspond to an isogeny between your two elliptic curves. Okay. So that's Delphs Galbraith. And so here I was sort of explaining that you just take these steps until you find your blue node and then between the blue nodes you can find a, a path. But I didn't explain how you take steps in this graph. So to do that, we need to introduce what's called the modular polynomial. And the modular polynomial uh, of level L um, just parameterizes pairs of elliptic curves that have an L isogeny between them. So it's symmetric in X and Y, and it's of degree NL in both X and Y. And NL is given by this formula, but most importantly, when L is prime, it's just L plus one. And so the really important thing about this polynomial is that if you have uh, if you evaluate it at j1 and j2, then this will equal zero if and only if um, these j invariants represent elliptic curves that are connected by an L isogeny. So in particular, sort of translating this back to our problem, um, the roots of this polynomial when you evaluate uh, it at y equals j are just the neighbors of J in your graph, um, in your L isogeny graph. Um, so what we can do is if we're at a, at a vertex which is labeled by J, we can find the roots of this polynomial and uh, in, to find the neighbors of, um, of that vertex. And um, so to take a step, what we would do is we would find the roots of this polynomial, choose one of the roots, and then take a step to that one. Um, and also sort of like a technical detail is that because we're working over sort of a fixed finite field, we can just reduce this mod P. And that helps with like memory issues. Um, but yeah, that's just a technical condition. That's why I'll be labeling the modular polynomial with the P at the end. Okay, so yeah, this sort of depicts what I was describing above to take a step in our graph. Um, and we want this step to be self-avoiding. And what I mean by this is that you don't want to like go back to where you came from. So JP is our previous, 
the, the J invariant that we were previously on, and JC is our current J invariant. So we store these two J invariants, and we want to step to some neighbor of JC. We um, take our modular polynomial, and we quotient it out by x minus jp. And all that does is ensure that you're not going to go back to where you came from. You find the roots of this modular polynomial. And then you pick one of these roots, and you walk to, to that node. And you just do this along the graph until you find a blue node. Um, and then you, take the, you do the easier step in the middle. So, one of the contributions, yeah, sorry. Which one do you choose? Are they all the same? Uh, yeah, so how, when we implemented this, you, we just like randomly chose one of, the, one of the points. They should all, in theory, be the same. Um, so you just sort of uh, randomly choose one and, and stuff on it. So one of our contributions of the paper is that we uh, implement the del Scalbraith algorithm and we do a couple of optimizations. The first one is in the original del Scalbraith paper, they don't actually tell you which graph to walk on. So we chose to walk on the two isogeny graph because this means that you compute a square root. So if we go back here, to take a step, you have to compute the roots of this polynomial. And the, the simplest choice is just to choose L equals 2, because it means that you just have to solve a quadratic equation. Whereas if L equals 3, then you have to solve a cubic, etc. And that's worse complexity. So we chose L equals 2. Uh, the next one is we sort of optimized how we do square roots. So we managed to get it in using this paper. Uh, two exponentiations in FP and just a few multiplications and additions. And we took random walks in our two isogeny graph. Um, and we did this using a depth first search with a bounded depth. And we chose this depth. So that's sort of the volume of our tree covered enough nodes that we would expect to find a blue node. Um, okay, and we ran a bunch of experiments uh, with uh, this optimized implementation and with a lot of different primes of different bit sizes and a lot of different starting nodes. And we found that experimentally, the average number of FP multiplications that you need to um, find a path to a subfield node. So that's just from starting from an FP squared node to find one of the blue nodes. It takes that many FP multiplications. So um, yeah, C is just between 0 0.75 and 1.05. You've got that square root of P factor there um, and a log P factor. So the next contribution was sort of improving on this concrete complexity. And the overview um, of this attack is that we change the first step. So because the bottleneck of del Scalbraith is finding a subfield node, um, so finding one of those blue nodes, we really focused on improving this step. Um, as this is what would sort of affect the concrete compl complexity. So um, at each step, we want to know if our, the node that we're on is L isogenous to a blue node. But sort of the key observation is that you don't need to know what this node actually is. All you need to know is whether it lies in FP in your subfield. So because this is sort of less information, you'd hope that you can do it in a more efficient way than computing roots. And um, yeah, this is where our fast subfield root detection comes in. So at each step of our random walk, we inspect the L isogeny graph. 
with fast subfield root detection. Um, and we do this root detection for L in sort of a carefully chosen set to detect whether it has an L isogenous neighbor. And the two bits in red is what I'll try to explain in bigger depth. But the general idea, if I can just, is that if you were somehow able to um, detect whether these nodes are lie in a subfield in an efficient way, you can reach a larger proportion of the graph at each step. So if you just consider L equals two, you're only revealing three nodes in your graph. In fact, you're only revealing two because one of them is where you've come from. But if you were somehow able to explore the graph for higher L, you could reach a much larger uh, proportion of the graph at each step. The key is that you want this detection to be efficient. Um, okay, so. So recall to take a step, we want to find the roots of this modular polynomial. Um, and in general, this is quite a high degree polynomial. So just finding all the roots of them is very, very inefficient. But we want to find a way of detecting whether it has a root in FP. As a root of this polynomial in FP would correspond to a J invariant that lies in FP on our graph. And we want to do this without finding roots. So this is the main lemma of our paper. And basically what it says is that we can detect whether this polynomial has a root in FP by just taking the GCD of the polynomial along with this Frobenius map acting on our polynomial. And the Frobenius map just takes elements of FP and um, sets them to the, like A goes to A to the P. So it'll act on the coefficients of this polynomial by raising them to the power of P. And it turns out if you take the greatest common divisor of F and the Frobenius acting on F, then the degree of this divisor will be one if it has a root in FP and will be zero if it, ha if it does not have a root in FP. And um, sort of what's hiding in this lemma is that we don't really consider higher degrees um, because if the degree of this GCD is bigger than one, then you can't really say whether or not it has a root in FP. But for ap our application, the degree will only be bigger than one for like a very ne like a le negligible amount of um, the nodes. So if the degree is bigger than one, we just discard it and we move on to the next node. Um, and because it only happens sort of like ne negligibly often, it doesn't really affect the, the algorithm. Um, so yeah, the problem with this is that our polynomials here um, lie in FP squared. And what we really, to make it as efficient as possible, we want to avoid any multiplications in FP squared. So we want to somehow transform these polynomials so that their coefficients lie in FP without modifying this greatest common divisor. And we do that by observing that if you transform these two polynomials using a sort of like invertible linear transformation, which is all these like conditions are saying, um, then the GCD is unchanged. So what we did is we found an invertible linear transformation for F and um, pi acting on F that moved the coefficients to FP. And uh, because of this observation, the GCD is unchanged. So we can apply the same lemma. So in this very specific case, when we have it, the modular polynomial, this was the linear transformation that we used. Um, and yeah, the GCD is unchanged. And so we can apply our lemma from before. But now these polynomials are defined of FP. And so it's a lot more efficient. Yeah, sorry. The math is required at P squared arithmetic. Like the, uh, the linear math? Um, yeah, so in general it does, 
but for this particular case, um, it didn't because all this is doing is sort of, if you view elements of FP squared as like A plus B times alpha, where alpha is sort of the generator, um, all you're taking is you're taking the, uh, for, for this part, you're taking the bit that doesn't multiply with A of the coefficients, sort of like the real part if you want to uh, make analogies with the complex numbers. And then for that polynomial, you're just taking the imaginary part of the coefficient. So for our case, we could avoid all multiplications. And I think I have that. Yeah. Um, you can avoid all the multiplications over FP squared. But in general, yeah, you could have to do some FP squared multiplications to do the map that transforms them. Um, yeah. And... This fast subfield root detection, we actually did it for, in our paper in general, where for any, so not just for fp squared, but for fp to the d, where d is just any integer bigger than, bigger or equal to two. Um, and so we, we did this subfield root detection in bigger generality. Um, so if anyone has any cool applications for it, let us know. <laughs> Um, but yeah, for this, uh, for this specific application, we just use the D equals two case. Um, okay. So the other part of, uh, that sort of paragraph that I wanted to explain was how we choose this set of L's for which we perform the detection, the subfield root detection. So, um, Doing this detection naturally increases the number of FP multiplications that you do at each step. But the key point is that more nodes are checked. And I again have a little funky diagram. Yeah, so at each step, the FP multiplications, like you have to do some FP multiplications, but the nodes that you reveal um, increase. And so we wanted we want to find a set of L's which optimizes the number of FP multiplications that you do um, per node revealed. So what's important to us is this ratio of FP multiplications per node inspected. Um, so to do this, um, we first determine the cost of taking a step in the two isogeny graph. And this cost depends on P. Um, but it doesn't depend on your, the J invariance that you start with. So this can be done as a pre-computation once you know what P you're, you're applying this attack to. And then we determine the cost of, uh, per node inspected of, um, sort of performing this fast subfield root detection for an L, um, isogeny. Then we create a list um, of L's where each L has just that the cost of the inspection is less than taking a step. And um, we do this because we don't want to perform our fast subfield root detection on any L for which it's just cheaper to take a step because then you would just take a step and start again. Um, and then we find a subset of this list that minimizes this ratio of uh, FP multiplications over the number of nodes revealed. And this is quite like a costly thing to do because there are like two to the N possible subsets, but all of this can be done in a pre-computation. And I think in our paper, yeah, in our paper we give this, the, this optimal subset um, for like a bunch of primes. Um, so yeah, all of this can be done in pre-computation. Um, yeah, cool. So I thought I'd go through a worked example to hopefully make things a bit clearer. So, So the first step is just doing your pre-computation. So setting up your finite field, reducing the coefficients of your modular polynomial. And in the case of SuperSolver, if you're running the sort of improved algorithm, you want to compute your list of optimal Ls. 
So then once you've done this, you can uh, generate your start and end nodes. And in this case, we're taking these J invariants. Um, OK, so the first step is to find, so we're going to look at solver first. In solver, the first step is to find, walk in the two isogeny graph until you find a subfield node. And in this case, uh, it found a subfield node in 21 steps. And these are all the intermediate nodes that you've walked on. Then you find a path from your end node to a subfield node. And again, this takes 21 steps. In general, it's not the same number of steps, but for this example, somehow it was. Um, yeah, until you find your subfield node. Then you find the path between these two subfield nodes. And in this case, um, it took eight steps. And then you compose these together and your total path will have 50 steps in the case of solver. So now running our super solver algorithm, the optimal set of L's for this case was three and five. Um, so finding a path from our J invariant, we take a step in the two isogeny graph. Then we ask the question, does this have a three isogenous neighbor in FP? And to answer this, we apply our um, subfield root detection trick. So this is the modular polynomial. We apply that linear transformation to get these two polynomials now defined over FP. We compute their GCD, which is one. And so that tells us that there's no three isogenous, this node does not have a three isogenous neighbor in FP. So now we try five, because five is the other L in our list. And we also find that there is no five isogenous neighbor in FP. And so we take another step and we do exactly the same thing, where we linearly transform this modular polynomial. We get two uh, polynomials of which we take the GCD. And because now this has degree one, we know that we have a three isogenous, isogenous neighbor in FP, um, which has J invariant equal to the root of this GCD. So the J invariant is 35,387. So we complete the first path in three steps. Similarly, again, three steps for this one. Um, it, but in this case, uh, the isogeny that took you to the subfield node was a five isogeny. And then you do the middle step, which in this case took five steps. And you find a path in 11 steps, which is a lot shorter than the first path. Um, one thing that I wanted to note is that this middle step is the same for both algorithms. So in general, you can't be assured that for super solver it will be shorter than in, in solver. Um, the only thing we can be certain of is that our initial paths will always be shorter in super solver. And that's because you can view solver as sort of a special case of super solver where your list of L's is just the empty set. And so super solver in this first path will only have um, paths as long as in solver. In this middle step here, uh, we haven't changed the algorithm. And so uh, the, there may like super solver and solver will perform in the same way. But because this isn't the bottleneck, that doesn't really matter for concrete complexity. Um, OK. So finally, talking about sort of the results of super solver, we ran some experiments on a lot of small primes um, and many J invariants. And we found that super solver finds a subfield node with, on average, half of the FP multiplications. 
and visiting a lot less nodes. So sort of a concrete example is that for this 23, 24-bit prime, we averaged over 5,000 sort of starting J invariants. Sorry, there's a typo there. And we found that um, Solver uses around 110,000 FP multiplications um, and walks on 2,000 nodes, whereas Super Solver uses half of the multiplications and walks on a lot less nodes. Um, then we also did some experiments on cryptographic size primes, um, where we just started on one J invariant. And we just walked and performed the subfield root detection until the number of FP multiplications exceeded 10 to the 8. And we just wanted to see how much of the graph you could cover in that many multiplications. And we found that um, for, I guess, 49 50-bit primes, SuperSolver covers between three and four times as many nodes. And this advantage grows as your P becomes really big. So for 800-bit primes, it covers like 18 to 19 times the number of nodes. And this is sort of an interesting phenomenon because um, it highlights that the advantage of super solver only grows as your prime grows. And this is because the cost of our subfield root detection does not depend on the prime, the size of the prime, whereas taking steps in the graph does. And so as your prime increases, you can add more and more L's into that set of which you're detecting um, your subfield nodes. Um, and so you would imagine that as P sort of grows to infinity, you wouldn't even take any steps. You just... Uh, inspect the graph. So what does this mean for isogeny-based cryptography? Well, we only affect the concrete complexity of Delft's Galbraith, um, though this is very important for finding like concrete um, parameters for these schemes. Um, it doesn't affect SIDH or psych because there are faster claw finding algorithms. And this is based on the fact that the degree of the isogenies in psych are a lot smaller than you'd expect. So claw finding algorithms are actually faster than Delft Galbraith. Um, but it does affect these new schemes, B side and Ski sign, of which um, with the NIST standardization opening up, maybe they will be submitted. Um, and so SuperSolver is important in determining what parameters should be used for these schemes. So yeah, that's all I wanted to say, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks very much for the talk, Maria. Questions? Or questions online? I hope you're getting some more applause online too. I see hands clapping on that. Um, I think people online, if, if there's questions, can also um, unmute and uh, they'll be handled in the back by the tech crew. Um, so feel free to ask questions online too. But any questions in the room? Yeah. When, so does the root detection uh, work over you know, binary fields? Fields of characteristic two. Um, I guess that's not relevant for us. I do yeah. base crypto, but yeah, that's a general technique. I don't see why not. Yeah. I guess the only th the only thing to be wary of for this subfield root detection, if I just go back, sorry, is this issue where it can only really detect for degree one and two. So for your application, you are finding that the degree is actually a lot, you know, is generally two or three. It, it can't like distinguish those cases, but I don't see any reason why it doesn't work for P equals two. On the next page, do it by two. Yeah, but yeah, I mean for this application, no. But um, like in general, I think all these results would work for P equals two. So with like a B extension field. The GCD I think contains a lot more things, so you're dividing by the degree of the extension field, but it should still work. I don't, I don't even think the, the way the theorem is written down 
restricts anything. Yeah, I think we, we I think even in the paper, we don't work over finite fields. We just say some, we just work with the field and its subfield. So I think it would work for any application. Yeah, you just have to be wary. Like you can't obviously divide by two, so this wouldn't work, but, but yeah. Any sort of invertible linear transformation would then work. One of the reviewers of the paper said to us, oh, this, this, this should have, this subfield thing should have applications everywhere. And we kind of wanted to rebuttal back and say, like, you tell us because we've been <laughs> looking for more ones so we can use them, and this is the other one we could think of. Right. Yeah. Yeah, like in the paper, it's written in like a lot of generality. So hopefully it has other applications, but we haven't thought of any yet. Any other questions? Uh, I have one quick one. So, when you actually do your pathfinding here, you're you are swapping at each step among the various element variants that you're going to choose from among your set of. You've identified the set of element variants, and so you might take a step on a three invariant, then the next one's a five variant. So, now in Psych, you don't do that, right? Isn't it the case that? You have Alice and Bob, and Alice is say working on two isogenies only, and Bob's working on three isogenies. So, yeah. Yeah. right. So, there's a restriction on the way the algorithm runs there, but you've got more power basically in yeah. trying to find that. Okay. Yeah. So, because sort of this is the general problem, we don't assume anything about the degree of the isogeny. So, in psych, the degrees are very sort of restricted. Right. Um, Whereas for this general problem, they're not. So like in B side, you have degrees that are larger than two and three that you use. Um, so yeah, here we ha do have more power of being able to swap um, between different like degrees. And That's good. But could you still attack psych with this algorithm? It would be slower than the Hoffman. Yeah, slower than the It would yeah. still find like a yeah, yeah. It would still attack SIDH. You would find a path of any sort of degree, and then I think you can sort of shift that to the an isogeny of the degree you want. So that would be like an extra step, but the complexity of that step is a lot smaller than actually performing this attack. You could compute a really large two to the something isogeny in psych to the two hundred. I saw it in accidentally land. <laughs> yeah, very low probability, but land as you could be three isogenous to your starting curve because the gro those L graphs are independent. Um, so yeah, it could be you could get lucky with this. I guess I might say yeah. to find a you know that the shortest two path or you think that the shortest two path is the power that you compute, but it could be a much shorter. There will be a much probably much shorter on path that's there. We just don't know where it is. Okay, if there's no more questions online, let's thank Maria again.